This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 482. One of the things that I believe is core in learning is what I call anchoring the learning. And anchoring the learning is this idea that just understanding whatever I've read is not enough. To anchor it, I need to put that understanding through my own filter and put it through my own experience of like, okay, I understand this, but how does this relate to me? Feelings of loneliness among employees are on the rise with 72% of global workers saying they suffer from it. This sense of isolation is contributing to a real and growing mental health problem that affects both individuals and organizations. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast. It's the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where I believe that if you want to achieve true success in business and in life, then intentional and consistent reading is a must. Did you know we're just two weeks away from the 10th anniversary of this year's podcast? That's right. On July 16th, Read to Lead officially turns 10. Whether you've been here since the beginning or have come to the show recently, thank you for helping it stay afloat so long. Well, today's guest is an author named Stephen Van Cohen. He's co-written a book with Ryan Jenkins called Connectable, How Leaders Can Move Teams from Isolated to All In. I'm going to be asking Stephen to share about how he describes loneliness in the workplace and why we can no longer consider it a taboo subject. We'll compare and contrast loneliness with isolation and highlight some of their key differences We'll look at some of the modern causes of loneliness and Stephen and Ryan's framework for addressing those causes and much, much more. Hey, if you're in the States, happy July 4th, by the way. It's the beginning of a new month, and that means a new theme inside the Read to Lead community. The topic getting our focus inside the community this month is productivity. And when you join the community by becoming a Read to Lead Plus member, You get access to articles not published anywhere else. In fact, there's a new article each week this month on some facet of productivity. The first one just published yesterday, in fact. When you become a member, you also get access to a number of other things, like joining us for our guest expert training. This month, it's Lisa Robin Young. She'll focus on peaceful productivity. I love this concept because it brings mindfulness to what can sometimes be a harried process, as I'm sure you know. You also get access to my monthly AMAs, Ask Me Anything. And this month, the theme of the AMA is Ask Me Anything About Productivity. As a member, you can also check out our productivity-related challenge for the month. We do a new challenge each month. Of course, this month is productivity-related. All of this and more can be yours if the price is right. It's actually just nine bucks a month. That's all membership costs It's the Read to Lead community and a Read to Lead Plus membership found at jeffbrown.me, an easy website to navigate to as it's only 11 letters long, my name plus dot me, jeffbrown.me. I hope you'll go there to check out Read to Lead Plus free for 30 days. That's a window I'm going to be shrinking here in the very near future down to 14 days. But right now you can still enjoy a trial for 30 days. Again, it's at jeffbrown.me. Dot me. We'd love to have you in the community. One more time, Jeff Brown. Dot me. Stephen Van Cohen is a global leadership consultant and executive coach who's worked with hundreds of leaders from organizations like Salesforce, the Home Depot, Komatsu, Bank of America, and Bridgestone. He helps leaders improve worker well being, reduce employee isolation, and boost team belonging. A co-founder of LessLonely.com, no, that's not a dating site, Stephen has spent his career helping organizations humanize their businesses by creating workplaces where people come first. His new book, co-written with Ryan Jenkins, is called Connectable, How Leaders Can Move Teams from Isolated to All In. Well, Stephen, I'm delighted to chat with you about your and, and Ryan's book. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time uh, to be here on what I'm sure is a busy week for you, at least it is for me. <laughs> it is an absolute pleasure to be with you, Jeff. Tell me a bit about your uh, musical background. I know you play a bit of guitar, maybe other instruments too. I'm not sure. Uh, mostly guitar. If I'm in a pinch and I need to pick up a bass or a banjo, uh, I could fiddle around with it a bit. But, you know, I got into music accidentally when I was in seventh grade. I picked up the saxophone. And you mentioned being, you know, you going to school and potentially being a band teacher. So uh, in seventh grade, I picked up a saxophone. I was practicing in my room. 
It was awful. And my <laughs> dad walked in with a guitar and he said, I can't take listening to this. If you want to be a musician, here you go. Uh, and that was it. And I was like in seventh grade and I started picking around. And by eighth grade, I met some other friends who were into music and we joined a band and the rest is history. So from a connection standpoint, which is what my book is all about, mm. you know, I found ways to leverage music to build some social connectedness, even when I was in my adolescence. Now, maybe my parents would have felt the way your dad did, but a <laughs> saxophone was the instrument, the band instrument I'd always wished I'd taken up. I was a French horn player, so I was right I, I was in that camp and uh, you know, not a lot of outlets for French horn players, but I, I, I envied those guys in particular who played saxophone because it was kind of, it was the sexy instrument, you know, and, Ex- and, and especially <laughs> in the 90s. Yeah. The, 90, the 90s saxophone was like a hot instrument That's to right. be able to play for sure. That's right. That's right. Well, let's uh, start our conversation with regard to the book with how you define in particular, Stephen, workplace loneliness and, and why this topic is one that you know we often think is, is taboo at work, but in, in your view, cannot be. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we define, well, let's start with a, a broad definition of loneliness, and then we'll get more granular with regards to workplace loneliness. Mm. Loneliness is not defined by the absence of people. It's defined by the absence of connection. Mm. And that's a really important distinction because oftentimes we assume that we need to be in contact with others in order to feel less lonely, but I could be surrounded by people and feel completely alone. Like I was uh, at a really huge HR conference in Las Vegas last week and I was walking around and there was 20,000 people together in this space. And you can see all of these individuals sitting by themselves at the lunch tables, you know, not engaging with others. So mm. they had access to other humans, but in the moment, just being around people, I'm sure many felt incredibly lonely. At work, when we think about loneliness and we think about the absence of connection, There's all these specific connection points that show up through work, right? So I have connection with my colleagues. I have connection with my boss. I have connection with the work and how that work makes me feel, connection to the culture, connection to myself when I show up to work in certain ways. So there's all these different points that exist at work. And when we're not meeting the right quotas for these different connection points, we can begin to feel lonely. And as I'm sure we'll talk about in our conversation, that's really bad for business and it's really bad for worker well-being. You mentioned early on in the book this phrase, the catch of convenience. Societally speaking, what what are some examples of of ways we're, as you put it, turning our backs on humanity every single day? Yeah. There, one of the favorite articles that I read when we were doing research for the book was written by David Byrne, who's the front man for the talking heads. And he wrote this piece called Eliminating the Human. And the idea of the catch of convenience was portrayed really beautifully in this piece. He said, essentially, like we are a social creature who depends on our social connections to survive and thrive in the world. And because life is becoming easier and easier and easier, and we're removing the need to be one with other humans because everything is now on demand uh, and we don't need to rub shoulders as often in the wild with other humans, that essentially our species is being removed from the most important ingredient that has allowed us to thrive. And this idea we're seeing in all aspects of our life, and it is wonderful that You know, I could go on my app and put in my order for a Starbucks white chocolate macchiato, you know, with almond milk and extra whipped cream. And then I can walk into a Starbucks, I can pick up my drink and I can walk out. But that multiplied across all of these different opportunities where we used to have to stand in line. We used to have to engage with other people and smile and talk to a cashier, talk to a barista. The more that we're removing ourselves from those little tiny moments the more isolated and lonely we're going to feel. Mm. And we're just seeing these huge increases of convenience and there's a catch to it, right? Because it removes the opportunity for us to have restorative, connective experiences with others. You know, this really hit home for me with the example you gave in the book of how we purchase music today versus how we purchase music like you and I did growing up, you know, in 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 the 80s. Well, it's funny because when you look at, well, It's not funny, but one of the things that is very alarming um, when we look at the different generations and their levels of loneliness, the loneliest generation on the planet right now today is Gen Z. Mm. 
Gen Z is 25 year olds and younger. They're significantly more lonely than their baby boomer grandparents who are oftentimes living in retirement communities or living by themselves without, you know, um, a, a lot of close ties to, to friends anymore. And there's a phenomenon that's happening where in the first time in history, the emerging generations are far lonelier than the established generations. Mm. And part of the reason for that is due to how they interact and how they've grown up, right? So when I wanted to listen to a new piece of music, like one of my favorite records is OK Computer by Radiohead. Mm -hmm. And I remember riding my bike to Tower Records and interacting with the person behind the stand where you had to put on the headphones and they would play the music and you can skip the tracks and hear the the songs in real time. And then I remember standing in line. I remember talking to the cashier. Then I remember riding my bike to a friend's house because he wanted to listen to the same album. And I was the only one who had that particular piece of music. And it was a collaborative experience, right? So just for me to listen to a few songs required lots of human touch points. Now, right, if I want to listen to a song, I just say, hey, Alexa, mm. play, you know, Radiohead, OK Computer, and there's no human required. Mm. And for Gen Z, they've grown up in this world where they've had access to all of these things on demand. And it continues to play into this idea of the catch of convenience. And it's one of the reasons why that generation is lonelier than a lot of the other generations that exist. Mm. You know, we talked about loneliness, but how would you contrast loneliness with isolation? I think a lot of times we get these confused. Yeah, that's a great question. And we get a lot of questions about that because it seems counterintuitive. Being alone in and of itself is not good or bad, right? Like being alone can be restorative Mm. when you're in a state of solitude, right? Solitude is this idea where I'm purposely being alone in order to reconnect with myself. And when we think about connection, connection to ourselves is an important part of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's hard for me to show up for others unless I have time to like work through my stuff and like get back to a good headspace for me and to think through some of the stuff that might be going on in my life to give me better perspective. When I am you know, in isolation and it's different where I'm craving social connectedness, mm-hmm. but I'm in a space where that's not coming to fruition, that's when we start to feel those feelings of loneliness. And that's really bad for us. So, you know, aloneness could be good or bad, just depending on if it's purposeful and if it's something that we're after. Uh, and it's something that could be really good and it's something that can be really dire. There is a a study that fascinated me, referenced early in the book, uh, that I think has been replicated a number of times in different contexts since it was was first attempted. And and it's around this context. Despite what we say we want, while say going through Starbucks and not having to interact with a human, like you said, or maybe on a subway or in an airport or a waiting room, which is basically to be left alone, we're actually happier when we are doing what? Yeah, Nick Apley is the behavioral scientist from the University of Chicago who put on the experiment that you're referencing. And the research is really interesting because we think that when we are around other people, it would be too hard and too awkward to just spark up a random conversation with a stranger, right? And we play out the scenario in our head of like, ah, I don't know, like this is going to be weird. What if this person doesn't want to talk and I'm interjecting whatever they're doing on their phone. Like there's all of these uncomfortable feelings that tend to spark in us when we're in situations where we're around strangers. Mm. But the research that you're referring to from Nick found that when we are forced to make social connection with the people around us, the experience of the bus ride, the train ride, sitting in the waiting room, being in the taxi, when they're first creating that moment, And the person who is receiving in that moment say that they have a more enjoyable, happier, and healthier. So it's really amazing when we start to understand that our brain is giving us this head fake of like, oh, don't do that. This is going to be really awful. And then when we do it, we realize that was actually really restorative and enjoyable. So there's something to it that, uh, you know, is pretty counterintuitive to what we think. And yet it's really important that we understand because those little moments can be really impactful. 
they they found that it only takes 40 seconds for two people to have what's called a restorative connection, mm-hmm. meaning that me and you look at each other, we say something, we smile, we laugh, we do, you know, whatever little pro-social behaviors we can do in that little moment. And we both leave with our connection quota being boosted. And that feels mm-hmm. really good. And that compounded is what allows us to feel a sense of connectedness to the people around us in our life. And it's it's something we often take for granted and don't think enough about. You know, I've seen that in my in my own life. Uh, I tend to default, as I think, as you illustrated, most of us do. You know, when I'm traveling, say in an airport, just kind of keeping to myself, and I've got reading material always handy, you know, on, on some device if I need it, or or a physical book. But every instance I can think of where I came out of my shell and I interacted with somebody was always a pleasant experience. Uh, I can think of one particular uh, flight, a relatively short flight, a 45 minute flight, and this is not something that I, I, I hardly ever do. But somehow, some way, ended up finding a, a commonality with the person sitting next to me fairly early on and having a conversation with them for the entire flight. An amazing conversation. And when I think about traveling in the not too distant past, that experience is always the one that I enjoyed the most yeah. because I actually interacted with a human rather than just keeping my, <laughs> to myself and, and doing my own thing. I mean, it sounds obvious well, you know, in some sense, but it, it still begs the question of, of why don't we do that more often? Why are we just so hellbent on just minding our own business? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and w- before I answer that specific question, and I'm sure there are listeners out there who might be going, well, this might be true for extroverts, but I'm an introvert. Right, so, right. you know, uh, Good for you, extroverts, for being able to (laughs) spark those conversations on an airplane. But the research that we referenced earlier from Nick Epley found that it did not matter. There was no difference between extroversion and introversion Mm. and the positive response of having those connective moments in these environments. So, you know, all of my, my introvert friends out there who are listening to this, understand that it's still good for you and it's not going to be as terrible as you might think it is uh, according to the research. (laughs) But you know, for me, I'm the same way. Whenever I get into my seat on an airplane, I don't ever have headphones in my ears. Mm -hmm. I always make sure that when I sit down, the person who sits down next to me, I create an opportunity for connection to take place. Mm -hmm. Because if I have my noise canceling headphones on, or if I'm looking at my phone, we are completely removed from one another, even though you know we're centimeters apart. Mm. And this might not be the the right reason for it, and and it's just been a, a positive happenstance. But mm. this year, so far, I've generated almost three hundred thousand dollars of new business from people that I've met on airplanes. Just <laughs> people I've sat next to and we started talking about why we're traveling and where we're going and what we're doing. And mm. it's sparked into three new clients that have been really good clients for us. So if for no other reason than to potentially build up a, a you know professional network that might be beneficial, it is something that I really enjoy doing and has been restorative and it's mm. been impactful from a business standpoint as well. You know, that example I gave, uh, I just happened to think about this, the, the person that I struck up that, that conversation with, and, and, and they talked as much, if not more than I did, uh, was, uh, was a Gen Zer, was someone that on the surface, you know, I wouldn't think I'd had much of, of anything in common with, but we found all kinds of things to talk about during that, during that flight. Uh, well, we've, we've hinted at some of these, and, and you mentioned eight in the book, but what are some of the modern causes of loneliness that you talk about uh, in chapter two? That's a great question. The biggest cause is busyness. Mm. So we are busier than ever. We wear our busyness like a badge of honor. It's <laughs> something all of us have and none of us want. And because we're so busy, we just have less margin to connect with the people around us, both at work and away from work. So, you know, busyness is a huge reason why we're starting to see increases in loneliness levels. Another big reason is we've entered into this new world where we've seen huge dependency shifts. Dependency shift is this really interesting phenomenon where, you know, 20 years ago, if I needed help, it would require some kind of assistance from another human being, right? Like I would call a friend or go talk to a neighbor or maybe contact my dad, who's a handyman, if I needed something fixed. Now, all of the world's answers are curated into our cell phones. Mm. So when I need an answer, I don't go to another human, I go to my device. And 
we're seeing these huge missed opportunities to share knowledge and to share helpfulness and mentorship and coaching because if we just no longer need to as often as we once did. So dependency shift is a huge separator. And it's another reason why Gen Z, these 25 year olds and younger are feeling loneliness at increased levels because they're younger than Google, right? So their whole world, they've been able to have answers on demand um, and those opportunities to to build bonds through helpfulness has been decreased. Mm. Remote work obviously is impacting the way in which we interact. We spend most of our working days Um, We spend most of our days at work, right? And when we're working remotely, there's a fundamental difference to how we connect through our communication. And we can talk about that um, Mm -hmm. if you want to dive deeper into why specifically the remote working environment allows us to feel more lonely. And then social media and technology, we're just communicating in different ways that are more transactional, Um, overly professional workplaces. We oftentimes go into work thinking and feeling we have to be a certain way. And Brene Brown says belongingness is essentially the opposite of fitting in. So if I have to feel like I have to be somebody at work, that is overwhelmingly lonely because no one Mm -hmm. sees me. They see the person that I am bringing into this workspace. So these are some of the modern derailers for loneliness. And what's really scary is none of them are going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. When we look at why people are becoming more lonely, we're on a trajectory to continue to have these derailers very much at play for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possible too, isn't it? For And you talk about this in the book now that I think about it, uh, for a remote team with a certain level of connectability to feel less loneliness than an in-person team that has little connectability going on. Yeah, well, what ha- what tends to happen is when the pandemic hit and everybody was forced to work remotely, the people who already had significant social capital embedded into their work fared pretty well. Because if I have been working with my team or my colleagues or peers for years and I've already had that sense of established connection, being remote wasn't so bad because I... <laughs> I've already been able to bond with them in ways that um, we've, you know, spent, you know, years building on top of. For anybody who got a new job during the pandemic, or for relatively new team members who had to deal with working remote through the pandemic, that's why we're starting to see these huge seismic gaps with feelings of disconnection because they didn't have that social capital already in place. Mm. So to your comment, yes, there are teams who are fully remote, who are incredibly connective, but there are lots of teams who are not. And part of that um, reasoning behind if they are or are not is based on what happened pre-pandemic. But what's really interesting about remote work is the reason remote work in and of itself makes connection difficult is because when we're working remotely and we're communicating through devices, especially when it's in a meeting on Zoom, the vast majority of that time is spent on tactical, information-focused conversations, right? So like, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Where are we doing it? Who's doing what, by when, and how? And when we're communicating like that, the frontal lobe is a part of the brain that registers all that, all that activity. The feeling of connectedness, when me and you are able to have a moment where like, you get me and you're asking me questions to make me feel like you really care or you're displaying empathy or we're sharing something that we can really smile and connect on. All of that happens in the back part of our brain, totally different region. So what happens is when people are working fully remote, Oftentimes, it's transactional, transactional, transactional Mm. engagement, meeting, connection point, and people don't allow themselves or they don't know how to build in the right types of connective experiences in their virtual work, and it just doesn't happen. Mm. And I go through this entire day communicating with all these people, and I feel exhausted, (laughs) and I feel depleted, and none of my connection quota has been boosted, and we're confused because it's like, well, I'm talking to people. What's wrong with me. Uh, And it's because we're missing this piece of moving from connection, moving from communication to connection. Now for that person who's listening, who is thinking, okay, what's what's the bottom line? Uh, What's the impact on on business? What would you say the impact of workplace loneliness ultimately looks like uh, and how it impacts the bottom line? It's so much scarier than people think it is. Mm. We say this is not a 
a soft problem to solve. This is a dire problem that needs a resolution. Mm. So we know that from the research, when someone shows up feeling disconnected at work, they're seven times more likely to be disengaged. And we know from Gallup that disengaged employees make 60% more mistakes. Mm. We know that when people show up feeling disconnected, they're five times more likely to miss work due to stress or illness. They're three times more likely to underperform as compared to better connected colleagues. And they think about quitting twice as often. And there's been lots of research from BetterUp and from Deloitte and from Gallup that shows that when I go to work feeling a strong sense of belongingness, my retention, my performance, uh, you know, my mental health and well-being, everything increases. And even without the statistics, it just makes sense. Like if I'm going to go to work and feel a gap between my colleagues, my supervisor, the work, how that work makes me feel, the impact that I might not know that I'm making, all of these layers um, that create disconnect would prevent me from showing up as the best, fullest version of myself, right? Like, how am I going to be motivated to go to work in an environment where I don't think people care about me, where I don't have close connections, where I struggle to get along with my boss and loneliness in this feeling of social disconnection is driving a lot of the quiet quitting and a lot of the things we're seeing in business today um, where employees are throwing their hands up to say no more. Like I'm not going to operate in an environment that uh, is not conducive to my connection and well-being. Mm. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs has gotten a bad rap uh, as of late and for good reason. <laughs> you suggest we retire. Well, I guess retire is my word, but I, I think it's accurate. You suggest we retire Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, for a new model, one that doesn't put belonging as Maslow's does at stage three. I explain that if you would. Yeah. So Ma- <laughs> we respectfully challenge Maslow's. <laughs> He's He's not here to defend himself, right? And like, I know this has been a model that has been institutionalized for so many years, mm. but we respectfully challenge Maslow because we think that while it's not the most dire, the most significant requirement we have as humans for like a really fulfilling, healthy, and, and long living life is that of social connectedness and belonging. And and he has it in the middle of his pyramid and the model that we built, it looks like a Wi-Fi symbol. And we have it at the very top showing that when you're fully connected, right? When you're able to get to that, that real sense of full connection, just like a Wi-Fi model, there you go. Um, that is when we're able to really allow ourselves to be the, the healthiest and most successful we can be. Mm. And um, it's something that we don't put as much importance on. And I wish people knew just how important the, the connectedness in their life is, right? We take it for granted. And I think part of the underlying, if we can call it a positivity of the pandemic, it did give a lot of people pause to say, man, I really miss my friends. I really miss the moments with my family that is not in the town that I currently live in and I'm stuck in for however long that we've been stuck there. Uh, I really miss having quality time with my colleagues in person, right? And like, it gave us this newfound sense of importance around connection. And I hope that some of those feelings can catapult us to do some of the more social, socially engaging things we need to do. But yeah, from Maslow's standpoint, it shouldn't be in the middle. I think it needs to be right at the very top. And it's what we're all really needing to achieve to be fully um, thriving in in our day-to-day activities. Now, at at the heart of the book is what Stephen and Ryan call the less loneliness framework. There's, in essence, five chapters dedicated to this. It's a chapter that sets it up and and then a chapter to each of the four parts of the framework. This is a big ask in one question. But I want to ask if you can to give us sort of a 30,000 foot view of what this framework looks like and and maybe why it works the way it does. Yeah, it's a great question. So the framework is an acronym, like all great frameworks, right? Uh, It's called LINK. And LINK stands for look at loneliness. So the first part of this process is you have to look at and identify loneliness in yourself or for Mm -hmm. others. We say in the book that awareness is curative, right? You can't fix something you don't know exists. So in that chapter specifically, we talk about how you could identify feelings of loneliness in yourself 
and what to look for in others in order to spot signs of loneliness with the people around you. Mm. So that's the first part of this process. The second is to invest in connection. And we used the word invest very intentionally because unless we're vigilant about making time to connect and it's a priority for us and it's something that we defend, if it's not an investment, oftentimes it goes by the wayside. So the second part of this model is what are the things that you can do that allow you to really make sure that you're finding opportunities to connect with the people around you. The third part, the N stands for narrow the focus. And it's really interesting. We found through our research, and this is all, the model is built specifically around showing up and feeling connected with your work. But we found at work, there are certain things that allow you to feel a sense of connectedness. And in this chapter of narrowing the focus, we spotlight these very specific work activities that when you focus on those, those are the things that make you feel more connected. Like for example, we learned that when someone shows up to work without a map, they don't know where they're going. They're not clear on the destination. They're not sure who to turn to. Like if I'm you know, going to work and I feel kind of lost on an island, holy smokes, does that spark a lot of loneliness? So narrowing the focus, one of the strategies is to cultivate clarity, like really make sure you know where you're going and who you can turn to and what the map looks like and what the plans are. So we detail one of those mechanisms in that part of the model. And then the last is to kindle the momentum and the model is built in a circle. And the idea is that if you've identified loneliness, if you've invested in connection, if you've narrowed the focus and you started to really do the things that help to create a spark of connection, Mm. the spark goes away unless it's kindled, right? Mm, You have to continuously go back and keep doing those first three things in order to take that little spark and allow it to grow into a big flame of belonging. So that's the idea of K, kindle the momentum. And that's the model in a nutshell. And we can dive as deep as you would like in any of those, those areas. Well, as, as, as far as, as books go and how they're laid out, one of the things I really appreciated about the book is at the end of each of these chapters, with regard to the framework is a summary with application and questions, which to me, and then there's, there's something similar towards the end of the book as well, really makes it practical and easy to apply. So I, as, as someone who pays attention to how books are laid out, I thought that was very, very well done. I, I would imagine that uh, that's something you insisted on versus say the publisher based, if I'm guessing in part on the fact that you teach this stuff in live settings all the time. Yeah, well, that's a, uh, thank you for that observation. I consider myself to be a learning and development nerd. One of the businesses that we run is a consulting company called Sync LX, and Sync LX is uh, entirely focused on designing really large scale learning programs for really big companies. So I've been in the L and D space for 15 years, and one of the things that I believe is core in learning is what I call anchoring. The learning and anchoring the learning is this idea that just understanding whatever I've read is not enough to mm. anchor it. I need to put that understanding through my own filter and put it through my own experience of like, okay, I understand this, but how does this relate to me? And how is this showing up for me right now? And how could I use this in my specific scenarios? Um, and when I do that exercise, that self reflecting through those questions and through mm. possible application that's when it sticks, right? And that stickiness of learning is what's really important to me. So when we were designing the book, Ryan and I spent a lot of time thinking through, you know, how do we not just spark ideas for people to ponder, but really get them to anchor the learning through some of these activities. So thank you for calling that out. That's awesome. I teach a cohort, which we're going through iteration number five right now called Note Making Mastery. And it's this sort of pillars of uh, collect, connect, crystallize, and create. Mm. Love it. Then that third phase, crystallize or distill and develop, really is about what you just described, this idea of anchoring and really making it your own. I loved how you how you frame that. And I'm gonna I'm gonna transcribe this conversation later and probably steal that for the for the cohort. Yeah. I give you full permission. <laughs> steal away. That's yours. Loved it. Loved it. Well, I was I was very much challenged 
to rethink how I view interruptions. It's definitely something I need to work on. As somebody who works from home, my interruptions nearly 100% are either a pet or a spouse or the spouse. <laughs> Not just any spouse, but the spouse. Uh, and I realize that oftentimes my response to those interruptions uh, is frustration, uh, is anger sometimes. And I, and I feel even like this chapter could almost be the springboard for a book all its own at some point. Yeah. Talk about why as leaders... We need to be interruptible and, and why that's so important. Yeah. There is something very powerful about turning towards the people who need you when they need you. Mm. The idea of being interruptible was sparked from a moment I had in college and my favorite professor at the University of Illinois, his name was Dr. Robert Husband. And this guy was just so awesome. Mm. And I had him my junior year and I did like a summer program with him helping to do research and me and him built up a bit of rapport. And I just enjoyed every second being around this guy. So my senior year, he wasn't my professor. I hadn't seen him for months. It was close to graduation and I was on the fence on what I wanted to do. And on a whim, I thought, you know what, why don't I just go see if he's around and maybe he can give me some advice. So not during office hours and not as a student, I'm in his building, peek into his office. He's reading. He sees me. As soon as he sees me, he puts down his book. He closes his laptop. He turns his chair towards the door. He stands up and he says, Stephen, it is so good to see you, my friend. Come on in. <laughs> and he ushered me in with this smile. And I just remember feeling like, oh my God, you know, like this guy's busy. And he is giving me his undivided attention because he cares about me. Mm. And I remember that moment so vividly because it really, really stuck. And as leaders, it's really hard for us to make time for some of these interruptions because we're so busy and we can't make time for every interruption all the time. But there is something really magical in being able to provide whatever your people need when they need it. And what it does is it proves to those individuals on your team that they're more important than whatever the hell you're doing on your computer, right? And mm -hmm. it gives them that sense of validation that they matter. And there's this great strategy from Tim Ferriss, and he calls it single tasking. And single tasking is this idea that I batch important sections of my week to do deep, meaningful work that are uh, interruption free. So it might be two hours every Wednesday afternoon and every Thursday morning. And I defend that time mm. to really get deep into my work. But batching time to be really focused is very different than allowing myself to try to remove distractions all the time. Because mm. if I'm constantly just trying to remove distractions, I'm not showing up in the right ways for the people who need me. So it's hard. You know, oftentimes my six-year-old, while I'm deep in thought, will pop into my office and say, Dad, can you please play Taylor Swift or whatever <laughs> she wants me to do? And, you know, I always think about this moment of she's going to remember dad playing songs with her in his office mm. when she's home from school. And those are the memories that I feel are worth being interrupted for. And it's mm. a similar component when it comes to leaders and their people. So, yes. Uh, I, I highly recommend the leaders out there to batch time for deep focused work, but allow yourself to be connectable and interruptible during a lot of the other working hours that you have. And one part of that story with your professor, the story's no less dramatic without this detail, but, I, but I'd love to add that uh, he gave you some advice either then or not long after that changed your life because of the way he received you in. I was very, very unsure of what I wanted to do. And I had a job offer to go do some sales gig. And he's like, I don't think you should do that. Mm. He said, you have a real knack for speaking and for coaching. And he goes, I can see how you interact with your, your peers and colleagues here at the university. He said, I think you need to go to grad school. And he recommended a specific grad school program. And I applied and I got into that program. And through that program, I got a job as a consultant, which I wouldn't have been able to get a job as a consultant without my master's. Mm. And that job as a consultant led me into starting my own practice, which was 15 years ago. And none of the trajectory would have likely happened if I didn't do what he recommended I do. Mm. So yeah, that, I don't know, 15 minute moment of, of him stopping to just have a chat with me and give me some perspective literally set me on the <laughs> path towards what I do now. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that.
Well, I believe I've managed to dip a toe in the water of every chapter, at least a little bit. What haven't we talked about, if anything, that you want to make sure we walk away with, with regard to the book? Anything I didn't ask about that you want to make sure you get a chance to convey? You did a phenomenal job being really thoughtful in your questions and making sure that we hit on some of the major themes that we've discussed. There's nothing that we haven't talked about that I think we need to. As a closing comment, I'll just reinforce that the amount of energy and effort that we commit to our social connectedness is energy and effort that is very, very good for us. Mm. We did not talk about the Harvard study of adult development, but Harvard has done one of the largest running studies of human life ever existed. It's spanned over 80 years and there's been thousands of people put through this experiment and they wanted to figure out um, what is it that is the absolute quintessential key to a long, healthy, and happy life, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty good question mm-hmm. to do some research around and, <laughs> and understand. And they found it. Like they figured it out, you know, after looking at medical records and interviewing thousands of people and doing all of these psychological analyses, they figured it out. And they found that the number one predictor for a long and healthy life is strong connectedness with others. Mm-hmm. And the people who have stronger connections, they live longer. They live happier and they live more fulfilling lives. And it's not something like that we are really working that hard to achieve. It's something that we just kind of intuitively think is important. But when we put a magnifying glass on the significance of all this, it changes the way we show up for others and it changes the way that we operate in our days. And I hope that this conversation sparks some newfound commitment to connecting with the people around you. Mm. And uh, I I hope we've achieved that with our time together today, Jeff. Mm, I think so. Yeah. One of my favorite things uh, about reading nonfiction in particular is oftentimes the reference to other books in that book uh, that impacted the author's uh, thinking and and life. Whether it's a book you mentioned in your book or or something else, what are a what are a couple of books that have impacted your career and life would you say that you 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 think about often or maybe recommend often? So the newest book that I've read that I've been recommending a lot is called Influence is Your Superpower. And Mm. it's written by a woman named Zoe Chance. And she's a professor at Yale and she used to be in charge of marketing for the Barbie company. Mm. And I really like this book because she does a beautiful job of talking about influence, not in this like persuasion science way where I'm trying to get you to do what I want you to do for my benefit, but she explains it in a way that's just really natural, but really Mm. impactful in how to get people to want to follow you. And I just love the way she describes some of the things she describes. So that is a book I've been leaning really heavily on lately. It's a really good one. Some of the books that are classics that have been really important to me, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. I I named one of my businesses based on one of the themes from that book. How to create really sustainable and large-scale change is something that I'm interested in. I have a master's degree in OD. So The Tipping Point is an awesome book. Originals by Adam Grant. That's a really, really good book. Mm. Everyone probably knows Adam Grant, but that's one of his earlier books. And it's all about the significant humans who have created these mega successful companies and teams. And he looks at what makes them original, love some of the stuff in there. Uh, And I can go on and on and on, Jeff, but those are three (laughs) good ones that uh, have popped into my head when you asked me the question. Now, it's funny you mentioned Adam Grant, uh, who's got a new book coming out later this year and, and trying to get him on the show. I've had a couple of other Wharton professors on the show, and I've reached out to uh, a handful and said, hey, can, can you make an introduction? And they all say the same thing. It's like, uh, he's untouchable. He's untouchable. <laughs> we used to see him all the time, but we don't, we don't hang with Adam anymore. <laughs> he's, too, he's too popular. <laughs> I, uh, can I tell you my funny Adam Grant story? Oh, sure, sure. I made a huge faux pas. So- I reached out to Adam Grant to write a testimonial for the book, and he responded Mm. back to me. And me and him had a really good exchange back and forth. And then it just ended up being where at the last minute, he wasn't able to do so. And I thought, okay, no big deal. I'm just glad that he was in touch. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. (laughs) So he did a TED Talk recently, and I watched the TED Talk. I'm like, well what would be a really clever way for me to get back on his radar? Mm. So I thought about all of the things that people probably mentioned to him after his Ted talk. I'm like, I'm going to 180, give him some (laughs) feedback that I'm sure he's not gotten before. So 
I messaged him and I said, Adam, I loved your talk, but what I was most impressed with is how fit you looked in your t-shirt because he looked ripped. Like, I don't know if you, anybody knows Adam Grant in a t-shirt, but he's like really strong. He's like an yeah. ex-college athlete. And I thought that would be a clever, funny way to like yeah. get his attention, maybe spark a conversation. And it completely backfired because he did not respond to my message. <laughs> I was like, oh no, you know, he probably thinks I'm some weirdo. And uh, I don't know if he's going to be recommending any other books that I might write in the future. Well, not to, to cry over spilled milk, we do have blurbs in Connectable from Damon John, Daniel H. Pink, Patrick Lencioni, John Acuff. So, so you did pretty well. Yeah. Well, I mentioned note making mastery and, and personal knowledge management, my fascination with that, and, and the fantastic advice you gave for distilling and crystallizing our thoughts. What are some of your techniques, whether as an author and someone who does a lot of research, you're interacting with, as we all are, lots of information all the time. How do you make sure that the things that you want to capture that you don't want to forget, don't get forgotten? Like, what do you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, from a research standpoint, a lot of the, what I'll call like biggest knowledge nuggets that that really put us into the path that we wrote um, a lot of our chapters around came from interviews that I did with different thought leaders and Mm. professors and researchers and um, senior leaders at different companies. And I recorded all of the interviews that I did. So I had a library of every interview. I did about 50 and I would record the interview and then I'd go back and listen through the interview. And whenever I had a moment of like, oh yeah, that, I remember that hitting me in our conversation. Mm. That's what I would write down in like a short list. And a lot of that, a lot of those conversations sparked a whole bunch of ideas that mm. really is at the core of our the messaging of our book. So for me, that worked really well. I'm not much, of, I, I have a hard time reading academic literature. Like I'm not a fast reader and I wouldn't consider myself to be a really good reader. So when you mentioned you read my book in like three to four hours, <laughs> my brain exploded because <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Right. That's amazing that you can do that. So for me, it's, I really love exploring with people. I love asking mm. questions and I love really mm. diving deeper into some of the ideas they share. So for me, that was my best strategy for, you know, mm. getting the information that we needed for the book. Well, the book, again, is called Connectable, How Leaders Can Move Teams from Isolated to All In, written by Ryan Jenkins and our guest today, Stephen Van Cohen. Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time. Love the book, and I recommend everybody grab uh, not just a copy for themselves, but maybe a copy for their entire team. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you, Jeff. Thank you. I did, in fact, read this book in a single day. It's a book that the audio version suggests would take you about seven or eight hours to finish, but I cranked that up to two times speed and had the physical book I could follow along with. That's sort of my speed reading cheat. And yes, I managed to get through it that way in about three and a half or four hours. When you're short on time and you want to get through a book quickly, but you still want to enjoy the written version, that's my technique. Follow along as it's read to you. You. And if you can get comfortable with two times speed or 1.75 speed, then you're just going to get through it that much faster. If you'd like to dig in a little deeper, check out those links and resources that Stephen and I talked about. Connect with Stephen online. All of that is at the show notes page for this episode, which is read to lead podcast. Com, and then the three-digit episode number, which for this episode is 482. Read to lead podcast.com slash 482. Remember the other website to go to if you want to try Read to Lead Plus for 30 days. That's jeffbrown.me. Check out everything we have to offer free for 30 days. And after that, it's just nine bucks a month. You can't beat it. jeffbrown.me for more information. Next week, we're going to welcome author Richard Schotten as we dig into his book, The Illusion of Choice. That's it for this week. Hope to see you next time. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 